Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today for the CFO AMA for fund managers hosted by the All Rays LA chapter. I'm Julie Robluski, the managing director and co-founder of Magnify Ventures. We are an early stage venture capital firm investing in technology companies in the care economy and family tech. And I'm hosting this event today as a member of the All Rays LA chapter steering committee. All Rays, for those of you who might not know, is an organization focused on shifting money, power, and culture. We believe that to change who gets VC funding, you have to change who writes the checks. Our focus to do that is to propel the success of women and non-binary investors in venture capital. As part of that mission, today's session will cover common questions and best practices in setting up and managing financial operations for venture capital firms. And specifically, we'll cover questions and topics like back office setup, audit, and compliance. I'm fortunate to be joined today by three deeply experienced CFOs and industry leaders, including Marie Drez, the CFO for Magnify Ventures, Sean Park, who is a managing director in Citizens Private Bank's Venture and Innovation Group, and Megan Greer, who leads the Carta Venture Capital Delivery Teams. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, maybe to start, Marie, then Megan and Sean, would you please share a little bit more about your work? Sure, I'll go ahead and start. I'm Marie Drez. I'm the CFO for Magnify Ventures. I am a fractional CFO, so I have um, a couple of other venture clients, but I do everything from back office, fundraising, compliance, human resources, so uh, quite a big range of of support for Magnify Ventures. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Greer. I lead the fund administration teams at Carta. I've been in fund administration my kind of entire 20 plus year career, and I'm excited to be here and kind of cover the gamut and the topics that are relevant to this audience. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Park. As Julie said, I'm a managing director at Citizens Private Bank now. Prior to Citizens Private, I was uh, a CFO for a number of firms, and earlier in my career, I worked at a lot of the, uh, you know, not just emerging managers, but some of the the larger sort of early stage Sand Hill Road platform funds that you probably would have heard of. But now working at Citizens Private, uh, helping emerging funds, uh, technology companies. Great. Well, thank you for taking the time to do this. You all know better than I do that setting up financial operations appropriately is critical to a fund's success and scalability over time. Uh, so appreciate that. First, let's start with your work. Uh, what's the typical scope of work for a CFO for a venture capital fund, especially for funds less than 200 million, who's probably the most of this audience today? And what does a CFO do versus others? you want to start with that, Marie? Sure, I'll take this question. I think for a CFO, I think it depends too when you join a firm or a fund. So can start with fundraising, make sure that um, you're helping your team with all of the DDQs and all of the policies and procedures and best practices, you know, crafting evaluation policy, getting the deck ready for investors, the room ready, the data room ready, to setting up the back office, setting up a management company, and reporting to your LPs. I mean, it's such a long list of things that it you can't even you can't even list it here. There's so many things. There's the AML policy, KYC policy. I mean it's such a huge it's such a huge range of things that it's really tough um, helping select a fund admin if that's the way you go. So um, your audit team, your tax team, according to your LPs, what does that look like? It's such a big range, like I said. So that's just a few of the things that that I do. Uh, I keep it simple. <laughs> the way I would describe it is there's two sort of, call it, uh, functional areas. There's more, but we'll, we'll say investing and everything else. We deal with everything else, pretty much. It's kind of the way I parcel it off. And another way to put it is uh, to help the GPs sleep well at night. <laughs> That's generally our role. 
That's very true. Uh, mm -hmm. Megan, when should a fund hire a CFO specifically? And you talk a little bit about what manager, managers mm -hmm. should do if they don't yet have the budget to hire a CFO. Yep. And, and that was exactly, you're leading me in the perfect direction, Julie, of, you know, Marie kind of said all of the laundry list of things that a CFO can potentially provide. And it doesn't have to be kind of exhaustive of, it can be kind of different scopes. You can engage a, a fractional CFO to kind of complete um, one or certain parts of that or the full scope. There's different kind of individuals who provide kind of fractional CFO services. There's entities that are um, providing that service. And so I think you can kind of um, choose your own adventure, if you will. You find the right provider, which can kind of match those underlying things that you ultimately need, maybe where something that's a little bit outside of your expertise or your comfort zone or that you haven't done before, you can leverage an expert to do those things. But um, it doesn't necessarily have to be exhaustive if you're a first time manager or kind of starting, you know, early on. The other thing I would say is just, you know, across, you know, across our kind of entire customer base, what we typically see is somewhere between, you know, fund two and fund three. That's when it's like, absolutely necessary. But I think, you know, as early on as you can engage this expertise, it's certainly helpful in terms of just the overall operational aspects of the fund. Uh, and it will really allow, you know, the GPs to focus on investing, as Sean said, of, you know, investing in fundraising, that's kind of the, the bread and butter. And then CFOs and administrators can kind of take care of everything else. Great. Yeah. So it sounds like start early and consider a fractional CFO as early as you can. That's great. Maybe we can move into a little bit more around back office best practices, which you all engage in deeply. I, I know that LP's needs actually drive some of the services and back office choices that managers need to make. So some of the back office setup decisions really depend on the LP's that managers aspire to. So can you talk a little bit about what are the bright lines for LPs? What's a must have versus a nice to have when it comes to back office? And what are some of the best practices that you think managers should be aware of? Sure. I, I mean, I can jump in to start and, and certainly Marie and, and Sean add to, you know, I think best practices from a back office of you need to understand kind of what's the standard. The table stakes is, you know, quarterly reporting, I would say. As you're looking at back office providers, there's so many underlying functions that can be completed. And so kind of making sure that you're covered in all of those areas is kind of, uh, I would say, first and foremost. Marie, Sean, if you have kind of other things to add. So what I'd say is you think of it, it really, you start with the LPA in a way, right? The LPA is going to be your, your constitution, your contractual agreement that drives pretty much how you think about compliance and running the fund and everything else that the LP wants. That's what you, the GP, have contractually agreed with your LPs, how you'll run the fund and various other sort of basically run the firm. And so in there, there, there can be some bright line things. Like sometimes if you're an institutional investor, for example, they may they may mandate that you have big four audit firm, things like that, or an SRO. There's certain things like that generally, but there's also sort of a, a section in the LPA that talks about management by the GP. And in there, it gives you sort of discretion around what the GP does, what they can do, what the ceilings and limits are within uh, the construct of the LPA. And so I don't know that there, you know, other than things like audit, tax, reporting deadlines, things like that, that are bright line. Um, there's a lot of, there is GP discretion, but there are sort of industry norms and practices that are expected as well. Um, there are a lot of things that, and most of it's going to be in that constitution, yeah. the LPA, as it were. So so you got to make sure you you know what's in there. A lot of it you will have negotiated. A lot of it is, you know, some of it's economics and a, lo a lot of the rest of it is sort of uh, compliance, really. And that's something I'd say, going back to your early question about when to hire a, a CFO, whether it's full-time or fractional, there's an opportunity cost to that. that. This is our career field. This is what we do. We're used to it. Does it, you know, maybe you have to be scrappy as an early GP with fund one and you have to do a lot of the stuff <laughs> that, you know, ordinarily would fall under the purview of the CFO. But at a certain point, you got to weigh up that opportunity cost as Megan said earlier, you know, you need to be, it's strategy and investing, raising capital. That's probably where your time's best spent. And I rarely met a GP that actually likes 
finance, accounting, and compliance, which is the arena we play in. So, yeah. and it's our career field. We understand it. We know it. So, so those are some of the things you should think about. What about pitfalls? Could you each name quickly one pitfall that you've seen in back office operations when GPs are setting things up? Marie, could you start? I typically say the pitfall is when it comes time to audit. So a GP who doesn't have a fractional CFO and they get into some valuation or review of the financials that, you know, now the auditors are, they want to make sure and they test, did you, did you review the financials? Did you look at the bank statements? Can you prove that to me? show? Not just like you have to show proof that you did that. So, I think I think the pitfall comes then because they don't realize it as they're managing out their fund until they go through their first time audit and oops, you know uh, that happened. So I see I see it mainly during then. The thing that I would say is, you know, when you're kind of picking your key providers, you know, audit, tax, banking, administration, you know, keep in mind how they play together you know, make sure that your providers specialize in your strategy, um, even if that's kind of defined as venture capital. So as an example, if you pick, you know, a local audit firm that hasn't done venture before because you know somebody or have a relationship at that firm, it can be very challenging for, you know, just all of the parties involved and GP included in terms of just the process is harder. I would say the same on the banking side of, you know, make sure that there's kind of a venture practice. They understand they have the technology to support venture and kind of the investment to to support venture so that as things progress along the way, you're kind of with experts, you can leverage those experts and kind of the, the network can play really well together because, you know, there's relationships and partnerships and all, and all of that good stuff where, you know, oftentimes there's, you know, clear process or we work together a lot. It's a small industry. And so understanding, you know, how to navigate that and asking the right questions to make sure that you have providers that are centric to your strategy is really important. Yeah, I, I agree with that too, Megan. I was thinking of fund formation council. You see sometimes where, you know, people go off, you know, and, and find someone. Sometimes I've seen where it's like, uh, you know, it was deal council, but I really trusted the person and, and he or she said, oh yeah, well, I can help you with the fund. But then you find that they actually cannot. They're using like a boilerplate LPA template and then you end up paying much more because it's it's like you have to have their time and then they have to call someone else from the from their firm that actually understands SEC compliance or fund formation. That's definitely, a, you know, picking your vendors, you know, talk to other GPs out there. You know, I always say, you know, I've never seen a bad demo and anyone that's given me a reference has always been a good reference. You never get a bad reference. So, you know, talk, talk to people in the industry, talk to people you trust, other peers, other other GPs. And, and get a sense of who the, the good vendors are that are a good fit for you out there. I want to dig into that a little bit more in terms of fund admin. What does a fund admin do and what makes a good one? Marie? A fund admin does a lot of the day-to-day -day work that that you need to map to operate your fund. So the accounting work, the day-to-day -day journal entries, the cash, the capital calls, and I think how you pick a good fund admin, as Sean said, is you need to go and ask other people, go and talk to your network and and see which ones the GPs like and that they like working with. Because all of a sudden, there's a huge gamut of fund admins out there now. So I think price will, of course, come into play. What type of technology the fund admin has for your LPs when they log into their portal and what other services they offer besides you know, the the day-to-day -day stuff, but what their portal looks like for your LP. And just to add to that, I think kind of understanding, you know, there's there's a couple of different flavors of fund admin. You know, there's kind of the traditional, maybe a little bit lighter on tech, but really kind of service focused, good people. You have kind of tech only, and then you have kind of the the blend of both. And so kind of understanding, you know, what is important to you is a good kind of initial question to ask yourself. And then I think it's a good call out to understand, you know, comprehensively what's the the service offering. So it can just be kind of the the things that Marie mentioned, but there can also be, you know, help to to set up funds or fund formation or, you know, 
at Carta, we have kind of a six week journey to help with, with that process and kind of the operationalizing the fund and kind of getting man- new managers stood up. And so there's things that can exist beyond what you might just think about as um, kind of back office operations. And so understanding kind of what you need and then what providers can offer is certainly helpful to think about going in. Yeah, I I would just add to that and just say, you know, manage your expectation as a GP. Understand that there's a scope of work There's a and there's a reason for that. I I find that often that the sort of this mismatch in expectation is that a fund admin will do everything, including CFO work and, you know, Mm -hmm. general GC work and compliance and everything else. You know, maybe they're out there somewhere. I've never seen that, but maybe it exists somewhere in the world. But make sure you, you manage your expectation as a GP especially as a new GP. And if you don't have, you elect not to have a, a CFO helping you for one reason or another, make sure you understand the scope of work and what the fund admin actually does for you. Generally around the fund and the management company, you know, it's generally going to be GL, accounting, that kind of stuff. It, it's not necessarily going to be HR, payroll, insurance, all these other things that Marie and, and fractional CFOs and CFOs generally deal with. Great. Specific question from the audience, and Marie, I'll start with you since this comes up a lot for us. What can be charged to the fund? Can you explain a little bit for those who might not be familiar what that means? Again, you have to go back to your um, limited partnership agreement and really read through what's allowed to be charged back to the fund and what isn't. So I can't really, that's so, you have to really look back at your LPA and see what can be charged to the fund. So I'm hearing get a bound copy of your LPA and keep it on your desk. Yes, yeah, pretty so. much. That's your Bible. <laughs> That's your Bible. It's a recommendation. Yeah. Okay, another fun topic with several questions from the audience is audits, which I'm sure is top of mind for a lot of people. So starting out, what is all required in an audit and when do you have to do it? I would also go back to your limited partnership agreement. <laughs> Um, You know, I would say most LPAs require that you do an audit. It depends on the timing of the audit based on your LPA. Typically, um, you see it issued by March 31st of the following year. But again, it's LPA specific. I don't know, Sean, if you have anything else to add. Just very generally, you know, in the LPAs and the funds I've worked with and the many that I've seen, it's very typical in venture that you have three unaudited quarters, and then an annual audited set of financial statements. It's typically the unaudited quarters are 45 days after quarter end. Sometimes you see 60, but generally 45 days. Audit is usually issued in 90 days after year end. So you know, at the end of March, end of Q1, that's typical. In terms of what is required in audit, there's so many things there. I mean, you know, they're going to tie out your cash, make sure your investments are, are right. The valuations, of course, the allocations, you know, if we got into that, you know, we probably need to call PwC or KPMG or someone to, to go into, you know, exactly what uh, assurance is involved. But basically, it's a third party CPA firm, audit firm that comes in and, and you know, validates that your financials are prepared according to GAAP, according to your LPA. And then just to add kind of a, you know, like uh, taking the the look at kind of the data set that, that we have, and that's a kind of across 2000 venture funds of, you know, it, we kind of look at like, what's the, the size, what's the maturity, who are you raising capital from? Do you have an institutional investor who is driving an audit? Are you an RIA where an audit is required? If you look at kind of our customer base, usually under 25 million, there's no audit traditionally, at least in terms of kind of what we see. It's certainly a consideration if you have a large institutional LP who's pushing it. You know, and I think it's important to think about like what's the cost over the life of the fund and kind of understanding how does the audit um, aspect come in. Funds between 25 and 50 million, that's kind of where we see it becoming a conversation of, you know, what is the uh, specific terms of the fund? What are the requirements? Um, what's the strategy? You know, and, and that's kind of the middle bucket where uh, there may be an audit or not in terms of the funds that we see. And then kind of over 50 million, that's where it's, you know, pretty much an absolute where it's advantageous, both from fund rating, raising perspective, you know, track record, et cetera. You know, so I think also consider, 
the trajectory if you want to kind of establish a more institutional LP base over time, it might be advantageous to kind of have an audit from the start. But if you're, you know, kind of just starting and maybe it's a smaller fund, maybe it's just friends and family, um, it isn't a kind of regulatory requirement unless there's, you know, you're in the Cayman Islands or you're an RIA or some of those other things that I mentioned. Got it. Great. Yeah. And Sean, you mentioned uh, valuations, and I'm wondering if you all can comment on what should be included in a valuation policy and when firms should use it. Well, this, again, that's another one. There's a lot of things in there, but you're going to, you know, you, you, you want to talk about the process. You want to talk about the, the methodologies that you use. There, there's guidance out there that t- speaks to exactly what is allowable under GAAP. There's a uh, uh, investment company guide and some other, you know, some more literature you go to. But generally, you'd probably go to your auditors every year. You're going to meet with them, assuming you have an audit, and talk about, you know, what's changed this year, what their expectation is, and you know, really sort of document the process uh, around what you do. What I would say is um, one sort of general <laughs> policy in your policy is. You know, if you're going to put it in there, make sure you do it. There's nothing worse than sort of putting something in your policy and then not abiding by it or following it. But there's going to be sort of, you know, the ones I had, you know, there's there's all the, uh, um, call it the methodolo- methodologies, whether you're using the option pricing model or probability weighted methodology, PWM, um, or you start with a, you know, we start with last round and then we go from there. Document that. You know, so so again, I would say, probably shouldn't say this, but I was, let's say, appropriately vague in my policies to where, you know, I captured everything, but wasn't so detailed that it was, you know, chapter and verse where, you know, I have to really kind of like make sure I don't fall afoul or miss something, which means, you know, you're spending so much time on every last detail, which you sort of are just in your day to day. But, um, uh, you know, I don't know if that's answering the question for you, but it's, it's, you know, if you want, there's so much to it in terms of level one, level two, level three, all this sort of detailed stuff. I would say, you know, you want your valuation policy, you you, you know, typically with an institutional investor, it's another thing like audit where they're going to want to see that up front in your data room, something you should put together. Work with your audit firm. And your if you have a CFO or fractional CFO, that's another place to, to go to, to to get one in place. And you know you you edit it every every year you review it and make sure it's it's um you know it's it's still appropriate and up to you know up to speed. Follow up question on that: Given the change in the market, we all know there's a lot of stale valuations out there. What do you see as common triggers or examples of triggers for changing proactively the valuation of a company? And I can take a stab at that question. Definitely performance of the portfolio company. Are they meeting milestones? What's their cash runway look like? Do they need to raise the next round? And if they do, what does that round is what's that round going to look like? Is it going to be flat up down? Um, what are the what are their public, if it's that's available, public market competitors, how are they, how are they trading on the public market? And I would probably, and then also, of course, work with your GPs to see, because they know the companies best, how, how they're performing and what, what they think the outcome is for that portfolio company. But to touch on Sean Park on the, on the valuation policy thing, I think it, this also ties into it is also when you craft your valuation policy, you know, have your work, work with your GPs so that they too are following it and document um, the process that you do every quarter that you are um, going through your valuation policy with your portfolio companies at Magnify Ventures. We meet quarterly and and go over all our valuations and document that process on a quarterly basis. Kevin, maybe I'll jump in there just to, you know, I'm the operational person. So um, kind of back to the initial question you asked, Julie, about the uh, valuation policy, and Marie touched on it a little bit there, but we tend to see kind of uh, five components and, you know, there's variability per, you know, as Sean mentioned, but kind of that frequency of, you know, how often are you completing the valuations? Is it annually, semi-annually? Is it quarterly? Um, I think guidance is quarterly, but 
usually that's kind of the quarterly review. And then there's a, a deep dive at year end, of course, yeah. the valuation methodology. So how long is the last round valid for? We see kind of anywhere between 12 to 18 months. And then when the, the round is stale, the, the question of like, what's your methodology to use to update it? And then the allocation methodology. So after the company is valued, how are you kind of, how is that value allocated to the stakeholders? Um, the fourth thing would be who completes the work. So is it, are you doing it internally? Do you have a valuation team? Do you have kind of val committee meetings or is there an outsourced partner? Um, and then the last thing is kind of the data collection of how is that working? How's that kind of operational process working? Who's doing it? What is the data that's collected? What's the cadence? What's the method? That's kind of super high level, but um, at least kind of outlines the structure of kind of what a val policy yeah. might look like. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I know that's top of mind for a lot of managers right now, given audit and the change in market. Um, I want to jump back for a minute to CFO scope and bring up some of the questions in the chat. Uh, one of them is, as a CFO, how involved are you in the deal structuring process and how involved should CFOs be in that process? I mean, I'll speak for me first. I mean, on the actual structuring, not much. To be honest, I mean, it was more about, for me, the role would be more about, you know, what needs to be checked and confirmed uh, from deal counsel and everyone else before, you know, we press the button to release the wire. And so that would be a lot of the time it would be sort of, you know, the term sheet was written by you, <laughs> you know, the GP, the investor. You've already worked out the deal with the, the company uh, and then uh, deal counsel you know, turns that into a set of documents. You know, what I would do as a CFO is I go through and make sure you provide me with the signed term sheet. We go through and make sure that, you know, the major investor rights are there, the QSBS terms and all these other terms are there per the term sheet, you know, and check certain things like, you know, who's got the block, what size the board is and things like that. And then maybe do some checks on the cap table, things like checking that the, you know, the options are in the pre-money and the cap table looks right and you know the, the post money and the pre-money ties out or if it doesn't why uh there was some conversion or something else discount so those types of things we're really checking um in private equity i think it's a bit of a different story but in venture typically that was what my role was we didn't actually structure anything down rounds you know there's been a few times where this is post 2008 though that that time frame where i you know, it got involved in the cap table gymnastics around sort of how do we, you know, cram down and wash out this company and then pull up the shares and 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 do that, but more on the sort of number side of the house. Another question related to CFO uh, scope. Uh, when it's time to hire an internal CFO or finance lead, are there any resources you all would recommend for compensation benchmarking or understanding market comp, knowing that it's there's probably a big range in terms of experience and level and things like that, where can managers go to identify how they should compensate? There are a few, there are a few resources out there. There's some compensation surveys. I know PwC does a compensation survey. I'm not sure if you have to pay for that now or you have to participate in the survey to get it. I haven't I seen it for a couple of years, that one. I don't have yeah. to Mm -hmm, yeah, we haven't seen that one in a while. BCBC does one, but you need to be a member of BCBC to, to access that. But I'm sure if you, you know, checked around in your network, you'd be able to get a copy of it. So those are some. I know that Carta does a compensation survey, but I'm not sure if that's on the fund finance side of things. I know it's for more of tech companies, but Megan, do you guys have I don't know if it goes into the specific detail of the CFO, but I would say there it, it kind of comes back to the scope, right? And so it probably is, can vary greatly based on kind of what you're engaging the CFO for, but in the fractional sense, of course. I have a little survey data on that front. If the people who submitted that question want to drop me in, it might be a little stale, but uh, one was shared through the, the Kaufman Network, some good data. Another suggestion there would be, you know, there's a couple of recruiters that specialize in mm -hmm. placing venture CFOs, and they generally have those comp surveys too, and they also have their own data. 
Great. Yes. I mean, I think if you reach out to any of us here, Sean and myself or Megan, we can get some some data and Julie. One other related question is how do people find a fractional CFO in their networks or through CFO networks? Contact Sean Park. He's, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, gosh, that's a tough one because I think it's harder to find, although there are firms now that are popping up that are offering these fractional CFO services for specifically targeted at BCPE. I have a list of those firms and I'm showing you have any other resources. Yeah, there are, you know, there's definitely a lot, you know, over the last sort of, I don't know, you know, eight, nine years uh, since so many uh, emerging managers have spun up and the you know, rise of fund admins like Carter, um, there's a lot more fractional CFOs out there. And many of them have come from, you know, Carter or one of the other fund admins that are out there. So you certainly ask your service providers, you know, ask the banks, ask the council and ask you know other VCs that you know if they have a CFO, uh, that's probably going to be you know a good source of folks that you can go to. And there are, you know, there's um, there are a few firms popping up. I'm thinking of Andrew Brown who who left Carter and started his. Oh, there's a firm uh, out of uh, Indiana, Megan. You you'll know the them. Shane. Bridge alternatives. Yeah. Bridge alternatives. Right. And there are a couple of firms like that that are doing specific you know sort of bolt on CFO work on top of your fund admin sort of you know, yep. fill in kind of a hybrid fractional, you know, mm -hmm. outsource role. Yeah, and I would definitely plus one to talk to your service providers. We do a lot of work at Carta to kind of um, build these partnerships, knowing that it's advantageous to introduce the the CFO to the relationship, it helps just to have the expertise, the accounting expertise and the operational expertise. And so your service provider could be uh, the first step of kind of pointing you in the right direction, making introductions, helping you understand kind of what the different sizes and shapes, if it's kind of an individual or it's more of a company looking to scale and from the fractional CFO perspective. So uh, start with service providers and administrators are certainly kind of waking up to the, the fractional CFO network because it is such a strong leverage point to make the back office operations just so much smoother. Another question was finding an outsourced valuation firm. I, I, would the same thing be true? Ask your service providers or does any, do any names come to mind? Yeah. And I, you know, of course I'm biased because I work at Carta, but, you know, I think that's where it, it kind of fits into that. Ask your fund admin kind of what their scope of services is. Do they do valuations? Can they help you with valuations? Can they point you in the right direction? Because many do. And so it's, you know, we do at Carta uh, as it's kind of separate to our fund admin kind of core offering, but it, it's good to know that the, those services exist more broadly than within fund administrators. Yeah. You can also ask your audit team who they recommend. Derivatas yeah. is another name that comes to mind that does uh, yeah. outside valuation services. But there's a, yeah, there's a number of sort of you know incumbents I would say that have been around for a while. Certainly, sort of software type. You know, QVAL is another one that's been around forever. Derivatas mm -hmm. are great. You know, and some of them are more like yeah, you know, software. You're going to have to you know do the input, but. Um, there are also a number of sort of the same folks that are out there doing 409As. You know, there's a lot of sort of uh, smaller shops, some bigger that that will do, uh, you know, 820 work as well. Right. And I think the, your point is well taken, Marie, on the, the audit firm, because it's such a focus, a focal point in audits. And so, again, if you can have kind of that connection point that, you know, where you have good partners that, that work together, it, it just makes everything go so much smoother. Right. Pulling back up from the specific questions for a minute, we all went through the roller coaster ride of the banking crisis of 2023, which now feels like it was so long ago. But I'm sure uh, many on this call still have some PTSD from that whole <laughs> experience. Uh, but would you each comment a little bit on what we learned from that and what uh, fund managers should take away as learnings and practices they should institute uh, now looking back? All right, let me start with that one. Just real quick. The thing I would say, look, is understand the risks. I think, you know, it's easy, you know, a lot of people are pointing fingers at SVB or whoever and whatever, but I don't know that anyone saw it coming, but it happened nevertheless. And now, you know, the, the banking tech paradigm is is different. There's a number of things, rising interest rates, the venture market, perhaps, you know, drying up somewhat, things like this. But 
the amount of conversations I've had with people, GPs, CFOs, you name it, that, you know, especially around banking and money market instruments and cash that, that really don't understand it. You know, I'd say, look, it's, it's not your day job, but, you know, it's one of those things that you should understand. Understand, you know, how capital and cash works at your, your fund and therefore, you know, the risks around that and then what's appropriate for you around banking uh, and think about other things that you can do to mitigate some of those risks or, you know, maybe the, the, the cash management. You know, you could do cap call lines and all this type of stuff to help with, you know, fast moving deals and all this stuff. But, you know, maybe that's not as meaningful now or as necessary now as it was you know two years ago when everything was nuts and term sheets were flying around and the deals had to get you know done in a day now i think the, the world has changed a little bit and we're a bit more rational across the board um, so definitely i would say you know maybe be a bit more thoughtful look look at the risks that are out there uh it's certainly you know as it as it pertains to sort of you know your firm the cash the capital uh, and your banking relationships? I would say for for funds, I mean, typically the cash doesn't sit in your account long, right? It's called capital for investments. So a little bit, especially like for emerging managers, I can't speak to some of the super, super mega funds out there that, you know, managing billions and billions of dollars. So, but I know that when this happened with Magnify, we, we acted really quickly and we're able to open up bank accounts elsewhere and and make sure that all of our accounts were insured. Mm-hmm. But we also worked with our portfolio companies. So making sure that, that, you know, they weren't affected with payroll needs or anything like that. So oh, I think it was, I think it's more, I think it was just kind of for, for us at Magnify, just strengthen the team, like how strong our team was with working and, um, and just, reacting so quickly and and being proactive too with our portfolio companies. I think that was kind of one of our, I don't know if it was a lesson learned, but it was just kind of like, oh, what we have such a great synergy amongst our team members that just, it just highlighted that for, for me. Yeah, it was another great example for me of the value of having a fractional CFO because we were very quickly able to call Marie to support our portfolio companies. Megan, any learnings? That yeah. Yeah, so it was super interesting from the administration side. So kind of just to give you some perspective before SVB, we had about 70% of our customer base either at FRB or SVB. After the crisis, we have customers at over 500 banks. And if you think about the operations of banking, which is in the nitty gritty that like you don't want to have to worry about, but like cash is king and having the connectivity to your bank so that your fund administrator can kind of do a seamless um, cash reconciliation and make sure that all the books and records are kind of up to date in real time. And, you know, your automated money movement, you know, think about kind of the, you know, how do you set up that, you know, and we certainly learned um, kind of through everyone's scattering of, all right, how do we kind of come back to the same level of automation that we had when there was kind of more consolidation around banking. And, and, and we're still like, we tried, you know, early on because the venture community, what we were hearing is that they wanted a kind of too big to fail bank. They wanted to move their cash to that type of organization. But because of, you know, Dodd-Frank and all the other kind of regulatory structures at some of these too big to fail banks, they can't, and exactly what Marie said, where there's not cash that's kind of sitting around in these accounts, you know, most of these larger institutions, it's, they can't service the venture community. And so I think it's been an evolution to kind of figure out, all right, who is emerging, who has kind of venture practices in the banking world. And that's kind of includes the technology piece of, you know, venture capital is, you know, forward thinking and it's innovative and by nature. And so the service provider should be as well. And so I think that was kind of a learning as we were all just trying to figure out you know, everyone scattering and first and foremost, protecting their cash. But then the second question was, oh my goodness, how do we keep operations going if there's kind of not the same level of connectivity and automation through everyone just kind of scattering to wherever they could go and open accounts, you know, the most urgently. Yeah. 
I know we at Magnify had a line of credit with FRB, so that also changed uh, as our banking relationships changed. But is there anything else that managers should think about when evaluating a banking relationship or anything that's changed given the shifts in the landscape of banks available to funds? I mean, I think there's a lot. There's, you know, there's a banking diaspora now. I mean, we splintered and went to a number of places, but exactly to Megan's point, you know, you got to understand, I think, you know, it would behoove you to understand, you know, the risks of the bank now, that's a given, you know, that's table stakes. You have to understand all those things I mentioned before. Understand the, the safety and soundness of the bank that you're working with. If it's a fintech or something like that, who's under, who's backstopping them? All that sort of stuff you sort of have to look at. And this sort of dovetails, you know, into the, you need a CFO, you know, unless you're going to do it yourself. The thing I would think I'd say is, is I don't think the dust is completely settled yet. I think the market, you know, there's still, you know, some lines out there that backstop by the feds and things like that. And there's people that have lines that have been extended and maybe that rate doesn't exist anymore. And when they refinance or go out for another line, you know, we're in a different rate environment. So, so I think there's a, um, some things are still going to change in the industry, but I think you know, one thing you know you all have to think about on on your side for sure is you, you you have a fiduciary duty to your LPs. You know now you need to think about who you're working with. You know is it appropriate to have two banks have something set up just in case? Maybe to have various sort of money market instruments or off balance sheet instruments, or if you're going to have on balance sheet, um, it's totally fine too. But make sure you understand what you have. Can you access it? Is it safe? All these things that Megan mentioned too, like, you know, it, it, uh, is the bank that's there, Are they? is it just a, you know, a passive money market fund essentially, or is it an active bank that's going to be your partner and help you think through all these things right. and actually provide services that you can use? Right. Well, hopefully we never have to live through that again. I think we're all yes, happy please. to have that. <laughs> um, Megan, you mentioned technology, and I wanted to ask you all how you think AI might change the CFO role or back office operations more generally. And maybe maybe you can give an answer in the short term and then the longer term based on what you're seeing now. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of looking at it within Carta across a multiple different use cases and even things as simple as like routing inquiries that come in to the right teams and the right places of just super basic things like that. I think that there's kind of potential use in terms of reviews, kind of analytic things. But, you know, I think it's um, we're at the kind of tip of the iceberg to see kind of all the different uses and applications and, you know, like how can we bring the AI tools within our kind of data walls? You know, it's kind of a key consideration as we're thinking about all the different ways that we can use it. So you're right. I mean, I'm a hack, but what I'll tell you is that it's funny because I've been fooling around with ChatGPT and, you know, building a number of things for myself and for my team. But there was a point there where I was like, wait, this is so great. I can come up with this stuff. It's not perfect, but you have frameworks and things like that. Fantastic. But then I had a realization that, you know, if, if it can do this, what do you need me for? <laughs> yeah, so I think it's a super powerful tool. You know, everything you see out and read out there, it's still fairly early, I think. But, you know, ultimately, I, I, I do wonder. I think uh, I always I think that accounting is really a giant if then, you know, loop and if AI can get there eventually, you know, may, maybe, you know, there's not much need for us, you know, left. Well, we'll reconvene this panel next year and see where we are at that yeah. time. I'm going to get to a couple of more questions in the chat before we wrap up. Uh, one is, can you touch on the standards GPs have to heal to when they have institutional LPs and which ones are particularly the ones that they should start sooner rather than later? And where are the critical failures in an ODD process specifically? I think institutional LPs might be particular with, do you need a big audit firm? Does it need to be the big four? What does your capital account statements? Like, I think there'll be a lot, a lot more, more detail in the LPA of what they're looking for. And then also, also if you have a fund admin, is what are their practices? What are their best practices look like? So kind of like 
treasury management. And I mean, it's that's there's a lot there. There's so much there. I mean, operational yeah. due diligence. You know what I do is I would educate yourself. That basically means all the operational risk of your firm, which is you know a lot. IT, yeah, a lot. cyber, AML, yeah. cyber, you know everything. So I I would educate yourself. A couple of things I would suggest. One, get get an ODD questionnaire from an institutional LP. Read through it, understand it. If you really want to have some brain damage, but it's, in my opinion, worth it, go out to ILPA, ILPA.org, the Institutional Limited Partners Association. They have a free, you know, they have a bunch of sort of model documents and things like, like NVCA does, but they have a, a DDQ that is sort of a all-encompassing one. It's overkill for emerging managers, certainly, but as you go through it and you try and understand what they're asking for, you'll understand, you know, you'll get a much better understanding of your own firm and the risks that they're looking for. So I think, you know, you cannot, you're not going to have a date, you're not going to have a, a server room, most likely. So things like that don't apply. You know, work with your service providers to talk about some of the things like cash controls and, you know, your valuation policy. And, you know, there's other things in there, firm culture, compensation, just a whole bunch of things, alignment. Get familiar with it because uh, it's going to kind of, you know, inform you as to like, you know, to think about your operations of your firm. So I think it's worth the effort, you know, worth the effort, even though it is a lot of brain damage. I think that's really smart, yeah. Sean. You can use it to, when you're kind of back to the beginning of the conversation, when you're looking for service providers, as if you can have some of that, I suppose, intel in terms of where things, you know, the types of questions that are asked in the ODD kind of indicate where things could go sideways. And then you can use that to inform some of your own due diligence when you're selecting providers. That's also a good way when you're setting up your fund to kind of check the box of what I need. Some things Shooting. that you may not yes. consider that they, like an IT, who who does your IT, who's your IT provider? What's your network security look like? It's a dual factor authentication for everything. And mm. So there's a lot of questions on there that might surprise you. I have time to work in one more question from the audience. One more question that came up is any guidance on handling LPs from different geographies? Well, it depends what you mean by handling yeah, them. Yeah. And what's geography? Like location? Yeah. Or off, offshore LPs? Yes. Yeah, like an LP from Europe, I think. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it depends what they're talking about. Structuring coming in, you know, setting up a Cayman versus a U.S. fund. I mean, I would say, you know, this is going to go without saying, but, you know, you treat them the same as any other LP, but they have specific things that they're going to want to make sure, you know, they don't want to file a tax return in the U.S. is going to be probably a key <laughs> key thing. This is, I'm going to say, fund formation council and tax. Talk to them uh, and understand the specifics, you know, uh, of this particular LP and whatever their issue is. I was going to say, yeah, fund, fund council. They'll, they'll be able to guide you. Well, this has been a very rich discussion. I learned a lot. Um, maybe just to wrap up, if you can each just give one piece of advice to emerging managers in terms of financial management, back office setup that maybe we didn't cover or that you want to emphasize from the discussion. Megan, would you go first? I think just be communicative, ask questions, um, connect the dots between providers. It was a little bit of the content that we covered, but I think that's important you know, as you're getting things set up and start early because the provider, it can take a minute to get everything set up and all of the kind of conflict checks and things that need to happen. So, you know, start early and be communicative. I would say talk to talk to other VCs and other GPs and see what they've learned and if they have any advice to give to you. It's always helpful. Sure. Yeah, I would say the same thing. Definitely talk to people, try and understand you know, how you're going to build your firm beyond just the, the investment side of the house. Don't be discouraged by the current you know, sort of LP you know, market we're in. It passes. I've been through a few now. You know, In a year, we'll be on the other side of this or whenever we are, we'll get there. Just uh, takes a lot of, you know, you got dollar for dollars. It takes a lot of calls, a lot of meetings. They don't allocate generally next day. It takes time. Just be patient and keep at it. 
Well, that's a perfect optimistic note to end on. Uh, so on behalf of All Rays and the All Rays LA chapter, thank you to our panelists for joining us. Please follow All Rays on social media. Thank you again. We'll see you soon. Thank you.